Right. Good morning, everyone. One doing okay. All right. Uh, let's begin uh, the talk. Yeah? And uh, then we'll get into our teaching. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for this beautiful day, God, where we could just come together and learn about the Holy Spirit, oh God. We thank you for the beautiful Holy Spirit. Lord, our comforter, our strength, our guide. And Lord, even as we learn about the work of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives, I pray, God, that you will speak in and through us, minister into our hearts, oh God, that every word that we learn, that it be rooted in our hearts and bear fruit in our lives. We thank you for this opportunity to study and learn together, Lord. We come at these two hours into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last class we looked at chapter 5, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, right? Now, a lot of examples there. So today we'll, we'll move into chapter 7, and towards the end of the course, if, there's, if we have time, we'll come back to uh, chapter 6, which is uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in church history. But I want to focus on chapter 7 onwards, and then this time we'll come back. So chapter 7, the work of the Holy Spirit towards a sinner. Okay, let's pick up a few uh, verses here. John chapter 16, 8 through 11. Now, even as we move there, we know that the Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity. He is God. Uh, he's not third in ranking, but He is God. He's, he is, in a sense, He is God. The Bible says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Right? So, let's read John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. Go ahead. The work of the Holy when, Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes... He will convict the world of guilt in reward to sin and righteousness and judgment. In reward to sin, because men do not believe in me. In reward to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you come, where you can see me no longer. And in reward to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Right. So this verse is normally used in you know commonly used to to reflect the role of the holy spirit right so it says here the holy spirit comes to convict one of sin convict the world of righteousness convict the world of judgment and also later on he says he testifies about jesus right so even before you and i decide to follow jesus even before you and i decide to be called into ministry or whatever we are doing the Holy Spirit is the one who draws us to Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us of sin. Now, there are several ways how the Holy Spirit can speak to us. Now, to, you know, to some of them, He may speak through visions and dreams. To some of us, He may speak through the Word of God. Through some of us, he may speak through a friend or a family member. The Holy Spirit can speak to us through situations. Right? So there are several other ways. Right? A prophetic word through healing and deliverance. So through all of these, the Holy Spirit speaks. But the reason to speak is not for entertainment. Right? The reason... The Holy Spirit convicts us or speaks to us, firstly, is to convict us of sin. So, what about in the life of a, an unbeliever? Now, there's a person who's an unbeliever all his life. Right? He's doing everything wrong. He's sinning against God. His life has been a life full of sin. And all of a sudden, somebody invites him to church. He comes to church. He's sitting there. Now the Holy Spirit begins to speak to this person's heart. What? You have done this wrong. See, what you're doing in your life is you're destroying your life. So what is the Holy Spirit doing? He's bringing 
conviction right now the pastor may be speaking about moses going up the mountain something right the message may be something about moses or elijah whatever it is but the holy spirit can use that to convict us of sin you get what i'm saying right so the number one role of the holy spirit is to convict us of sin now what about a person who is already a believer all of us are believers yes okay all of us are perfect thank you we're not perfect right we are all we all make mistakes but when we make a mistake what happens the holy spirit brings conviction into our spirit and we'll talk about you know how the holy spirit you know the senses the five senses that we have and how the holy spirit uses that but the point here is even as believers when we sin or when we disobey god he comes to convict us the holy spirit will say no what you did is wrong what he said is wrong what you thought is wrong what you saw is wrong right so he convicts us of that sin now as an unbeliever we have different responses to it now an unbeliever may say no i don't want this i don't want to you know he may just think okay this is my own thoughts i don't want it their minds are hardened the enemy has put a you know a veil over their eyes and they don't want to see this did this happen in the uh, new in the early church yes remember jesus came and he said i am the way the truth and the life i am the messiah i am the one who you all are waiting for they said no ways we are not going to believe this remember what stephen said you stiff necked people meaning after seeing all the evidence you're still saying jesus is not the messiah you saw him that he did all good things you saw the miracles that he did you saw that he raised people from the dead opened blind eyes all these wonderful miracles you know that he was without sin you made him die on the cross on the cross he forgave people's sin you put him in the tomb 3 days later he rose again he's been seen all of or by more than hundreds of people here and you're still saying that he's not the messiah what more proof do you want that's why stephen was so upset said why are you so stiff neck now the work of the enemy he blinds us the god of this age blinds us right so you have the truth i imagine the scriptures the bible is here and the enemy can blind me that means i can't see the scripture i can't read it that's natural blindness right everything is dark but in spiritually spiritually if you think of it spiritual blindness is what the enemy does he blocks us he blocks he veils our thinking so that's what the god of this age does the enemy don't believe this don't believe that somebody came and died on the cross and he's the messiah i don't believe don't believe that your sins are forgiven how can it be there is no messiah there is no god actually you need to see the god so then let's make a carved image have you ever thought of this in the book of exodus when you only think of it it's so strange the people of israel have come out of egypt they've seen all the miracles they moses has parted the seas into two they walked through that they said praise the lord they started singing they reached the next mountain moses said i'll just go pray and come back he goes to pray what are they doing down says moses is dead so let's all get our gold and silver together let's make a statue and worship that statue what happened these are the same people who were singing songs and rejoicing after he parted the seas into two but so quickly the enemy can blind us that's what happened so as in a believer's life it is our responsibility when the holy spirit convicts us of sin to go back and ask god for forgiveness 
He's doing it for a reason. The Holy Spirit is not, he's not condemning. There's a difference between condemning and convicting. Everyone say that. Condemning, convicting. I'm going to use an example of Vinay. Okay? Because I know Vinay. So. And I know he's not going to take it personal. So. I'm going to... What's the difference between condemn and convict? Vinay is leading worship. So, Vinay, the song that he sang was totally out of key. And all the chords were wrong. What are you doing? Now, what is that? What am I doing? I'm condemning Vinay. Now, what is convicting? Now, this is an example, right? Convicting. Saying, see, Vinay, the song you chose was a hard song. It had too many chords in it. And that's why the chords were all over the place. So some places you were out of key, some places you played in key. So now, Vinay, why don't you change the song? The next time you do this, Vinay saying, now, Vinay has two choices, right? Okay, Vinay is a very good worship leader. <laughs> uh, he's part of our worship team. Just using this example, right? So Vinay has, can take two responses. One, he can say, who are you to tell me? I will do it the way I want to do it. Yeah, it was wrong. So what? I'll do it better next time. Leave it. You don't have to tell me. That's one response. Two is... Oh, yes, I, I feel that the song was a difficult song and the chords, I felt that somewhere here I went wrong. Maybe next time I should, you know, prepare or do this and do or choose this. So what's happening here? There's condemning, there's convicting. The Holy Spirit doesn't come to con condemn you. He doesn't say, I knew you'll do this. I knew you'll sin. I knew you'll disobey God's word. I knew you will fall into sin. This is what I told you not to do. That is why I told you don't use the phone. That is why I told you don't use the laptop. Is he doing that? But the Holy Spirit convicts us as believers. He says, see, what you did was wrong. Now, I am inside of you. You are holy. You are God's child. Right? And when you pray now, you ask God for forgiveness. I will stand on your behalf. I will intercede for you. No, I don't want to. I've sinned against God. I've done such a terrible sin. How can I? Then the Holy Spirit says, no, you, you go back to God. He's forgiving. He reminds you of scripture. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. Book of Hebrews says, when he took the blood and he made atonement for us once for all, making us righteous and justified. To the Holy Spirit say, no, you do it. It's okay. You ask God for forgiveness. He loves you. No, but I've sinned. How can he love me? No, he loves you. Doesn't matter. You have sinned. Yes, you ask forgiveness. He'll wash you with his blood. You see the role of the Holy Spirit there? Everyone understanding? Right? So it's not like he's saying, you did this. this. He's not making a list of the wrong things. Now we do that. But the Holy Spirit doesn't do that. It brings conviction. So you understand the difference? Condemning and conviction. Now the Holy Spirit, however he's ministering to you and bringing conviction, it is our responsibility to be sensitive to that. Right? So early morning you may wake up, you have your prayer times in the morning, you get up and pray and then suddenly the Holy Spirit reminds you of something that you said. Now, what must we do? Immediately say, God, I said, I spoke like this in anger or I was upset. But you have called me to walk in love. So please forgive me of my sins. And I receive your forgiveness. I believe that the price that you paid was more than enough. And now my sins are forgiven. Help me not to disobey the next time. Help me to walk in love. Help me to be wise even when I speak. That is our role. The wrong thing to do is, as believers, go get up early morning, you're praying. The Holy Spirit says, you, sh you shouldn't have spoken this way. Then how should I speak to that fellow? 
you know how he spoke to me he spoke that way so i spoke this way what happens i'm hardening my heart to the work of the holy spirit remember this the holy spirit is like a dove we'll learn more about uh, the symbols of the holy spirit he's like a dove he's gentle god is not going to come on you shake you and say you have to do this he's not going to do that the holy spirit is not going to pounce on you and say you have to if you don't do then it's going to be the biggest problem of your life no he's not going to do that he's going to lead you to it it is you know you've got the you've got your will you've got the will of god the holy spirit will lead you to do what god wants you to do but then we also have our will you understand right so we must learn to work with the holy spirit understand that he is the holy spirit who convicts us right acts chapter let's go through those four points first thing the holy spirit convicts the world of sin what is sin even as we move to acts chapter 2 verse 37 and 39 tell me what is sin what is what is sin something that we do that is not according to god or according to his will okay fallen nature okay what else if we if we have the capacity to do good mm. but we are not going doing that it is a sin yeah but all good i'm just looking for three words three words what's it things of the flesh okay okay yeah yeah no but not all things of the flesh are wrong right okay what else we're looking for three words we normally use it s a n sorry what was that living a life against god yes that is sin oh okay sorry free of free of life that is sin free of evil okay good and evil okay those who don't follow god's commandments okay okay all of them are right okay nobody is wrong but i was just looking for three words uh yeah somebody comments here mommy comments rebellion to god's commandments that's good so sin is simply missing the mark god created us when god created adam and eve what did he create them as create them as their own image imagine adam is walking with god god is saying see this is uh, you know pomegranate this is apple this is how you have to put it under the ground they're talking the bible says in the cool of the evening they walk together adam and eve god in when god created us he didn't create us thinking of death death was not in god's list at all right but when sin came sin is we miss the mark see there's a bull's eye and you throw a dart it goes somewhere else God had called us called each one of us to live in holiness but we have missed the mark in every area that's called sin and when we miss the mark we are turning away from God and all the all that you have said is is right right not obeying God's commandments so the holy spirit convicts us of sin let me give you this example imagine there's a clean glass of water drinking water and i go outside and you know just take a drop of that drainage water that you see out and i put a drop of that water into this clean drinking water will you drink it why the whole thing is contaminated but it's only one drop No, glass is clean full glass is clean water 
purified from the you know water purifier clean and sweet but just one drop of drainage we won't drink it because the entire water is now contaminated that is what sin is as as a as a human being as a believer we are called to live in holiness but when we sin it's like one drop of poison or drainage water gets into our life contaminating our whole body and so then the holy spirit says listen i am the temple i'm i'm residing in you right paul writes to the believers he says do not grieve the holy spirit with whom you have been marked with do not grieve him don't make him sad he's got emotions don't make him feel like you know whatever he's doing don't don't deny him don't grieve him don't make him sad acts chapter 2 37 through 39 Again, this is when uh, Peter when the, is speaking. Go ahead. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brother, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, and your children and for all who are far off yeah for for all whom the lord or god will call yeah now think of this we've talked about this a lot actually so in the pentecost peter comes he begins to preach and after preaching what is the response when the people heard this they were cut to the heart that means they were convicted of what peter was saying now, is this something that was new? Yes, it's a new understanding. What does this man say? He's saying he's pointing to Joel, who's our prophet, and saying you will see visions, dreams. He's pointing to something. He's pointing to a Jesus, and he's saying that this Jesus died on the cross. Maybe many of them heard of Jesus. Many of them may have even heard of Jesus' resurrection, but they didn't really believe it. But now when Peter is speaking, they were cut to the heart. That means what? The Holy Spirit began to work in that moment, speaking to each one's heart. And how many people? Verse 41, those who accepted the message were baptized and about 3,000 of them were added to the church. So think of this. Maybe there are 5,000 or 6,000 people there. And they're all standing there. Peter's preaching. They were cut to heart. They were convicted of their sins. I am a sinner. So God sent his son Jesus into this world. And he lived among us. He did these wonderful, you know, miracles. But we crucified him. We put him, we nailed him on the cross. And now he has resurrected for us. He has defeated death for us. So I don't have to go back to those offerings, that sin offering, guilt offering, all of that. I don't have to live in sin. And they were cut to heart. And they believed the message that Peter spoke. Can you think of that? Can you believe that? Understand this. When the Holy Spirit convicts us, He can turn our lives around in one moment. Just a moment is enough. These people are Jews or Gentiles all their life. All their life. But they heard a message for five minutes and they changed their life. I said, I, I believe in this Jesus. They were cut to our heart and asked, what should we do? Paul responds, Peter responds, verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. You understand what's happening here? The Holy Spirit comes to convict us. It doesn't matter what sin it doesn't matter how big it is, whether it's a believer, unbeliever, it doesn't matter. He comes to convict us. And he will continue to convict people of sin all across the world. When you hear of people becoming believers, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. You hear of believers changing their lives and becoming closer to God, the work of the Holy Spirit. Everything is the work of the Holy Spirit. Two, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of Christ's righteousness 
Now, our righteousness is not good enough for God. The psalmist says, our greatest works are like filthy rags in his presence. Imagine this. What is the meaning of righteousness? You should know this by now. Very good, Vinay. Righteousness means a right standing with God. Now, for example, I want to meet the president of India. I can't just go there and say, go to Delhi and say, I want to meet the president. What will they do? They'll say, please go back to where your hometown. Who are you? But imagine this. I meet a great man and he says, listen, I will give you a letter. And with this letter, you can go and meet the president of India. All right. So he gives me this letter. This person's name is Paul Emanuel. He's coming to speak to you. He's, my, he's recommended by me. And I request you to give him 10 minutes of your time to speak to him. That's just a piece of paper. I take this letter, go all the way to the president's house. And the guy said, why did you come back again? I sent you home. He said, listen, I've got a letter here. What's the letter about? He reads the letter. Oh, this is from the vice president of India. So, so he, you got a letter from him. So, okay, hold on. You wait here. I'll tell you when you can go and meet with the president. Now, what did that piece of paper do? What did that piece of paper do? Gained me entrance to get into meet the president, right? Now, did I have a right standing initially? I had nothing with me. But this paper made me have a right standing to get into the president's cabin. Now, let's see the parallel, right? Now, everything that we do in our life is like filthy rags in God's presence. God is not somebody who you, we can, um, you know, puff up. Oh, God, you saw how I led the worship. God will say, good for you. Not good for me, good for you. You saw how long I prayed. Prayed for two hours. Nobody did it here. Good for you. For me, it doesn't change. Yes or no? Will it change God? He remains God. You pray, you don't pray, He remains God. God is not crying, oh, He didn't pray today. No, no. Now, we must understand that whatever we do, it's, it's like filthy rags in God's presence. But now in the new covenant, in the new covenant, right? Because of the blood of Jesus, the book of Hebrews says we, he went and he made atonement for our sins. That means what? He took his own blood. He went into the most holy place and he poured out his own blood and made a, a, a sacrifice once and for all for all of us. So now, when we look at the Father, he, the Father looks at us through the eyes of Jesus. And he says, okay, now you have a right standing. So Paul writes, uh, sorry, in the book of John, he says, through his spirit, we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, in the old covenant, there's no father. It's always been God. But in the new covenant, we have a right standing. We have been made the righteousness of God. Right? So it's not about the works that we do. It's not about how much ministry we do, how big the ministry is. All of that is part of it. But our right standing with God is through the blood of Jesus. Through the work of the Holy Spirit. So for example, last example. You've got the great Apostle Paul. Is he a great man? Great man. Did, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Great revelation. Planted many churches. Now Apostle Paul is standing there in heaven. And now Paul Emmanuel goes there. Standing next to Apostle Paul. When the Father sees us, we both are equal. Can you believe that? Can you think of it? 
I can't, so I can tell the father, but he's done, he went to prison, he wrote all these things, he's, he's much better, much greater than me. When God sees, he says, we both are the same. Works are different, but we are righteous by the same blood. We have been made believers by the same Holy Spirit. So there's no difference when God sees. Paul Emmanuel is my son. Also Paul also is my son. Now, the rewards are different. Apostle Paul did great works. Paul Emmanuel, not as much as he did. You see the difference? Right? Okay, go to, uh, let me just bring context here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 onwards. Ten to sixteen. First Corinthians three, ten to sixteen. Just read that. Now, before Wait. you read this, this is talking about when you and I, as believers, we will stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ and our works will be judged, what we have done in this world. Just read that. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive the, his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Okay, pause here. Now, don't you know? No, no, that... pause, pause, pause. Hold on. Okay, so did you understand this? Paul is writing, he's saying, listen. Our works, what we are doing, will be judged by fire. Now, if you if you done, if you take gold, silver, and costly stones, and you put it in the fire, put fire in the gold, what happens to it? it purifies. Does the value change? You take one kg gold, you put it in the fire, it remains so. But what about hay and straw? You can have a big pile of hay and straw. And you put fire to it, what will become of it? It will become ashes. So Paul is writing and he's saying, now listen, if we are coming to God's presence by our works, then we will fail. Because our works need to be like gold and silver, which will last the test. Because God is going to test it by fire. Now sometimes, you know, it's, it's good to see, you know, oh, big ministry, it's wood. It's like hay, you know, piled up. It's nice and big. Everyone are seeing it. But God is going to test it by fire. If it lasts, it lasts. If not, it will be burnt away. Right? So now, the Holy Spirit brings us to a place of righteousness. Not our own righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. So it's like, you know, I can get this picture of this. Like the Father sitting on his throne. And we as believers are afraid to go to his presence. Just an example. And then you've got Jesus saying, come. come. I've made you righteous. It's all right. You are righteous. When, when, when the Father is seeing you, you will have a right standing because you believed in, in what I have done. Because we believe in the sacrifice that Jesus did. So you get that understanding now? right? He convicts the world of righteousness. What does the enemy say? You are a sinner. He's an accuser of the brethren. He accuses. How will God forgive you? You've done the worst sin. Forget about God. Go back to what you were doing. God also is sad. You are also sad. Go commit suicide. Go end your life. Or go back and live a sinful life. What is the use? That's what the enemy does. But Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is saying, I made you righteous. Right? Third one. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of 
judgment. Now, this is a hard word. We must understand that there are consequences to our actions. All through the Old Testament, God, when he de dealt with people, there are, there are consequences to our actions. The Israelites sinned. The Israelites did many things against God. They had to go through consequences. Yes or no? Yes. Now, I've shared this before. The promised land to Egypt is about, take about 15 to 20 days by camel and walk with rest. How many days? Egypt to the promised land. How many days? 20 days? Okay, with rest, all of it. Okay. People say, okay, you take breaks quite often. Okay. 25, okay, 40 days. In 40 days, you can go Egypt all the way to the promised land. Now, if you read the book of Exodus onwards, Exodus numbers, what did God do? There was a mountain, Mount Seir. God took them out of Egypt, they began to sin. So what did he do? He took them around the mountain. All they were doing was going around the mountain for 40 years. Imagine, they're going in circles. They thought we're making ground to the promised land. But they're just going circles. So this is the mountain. They're going around that place, coming back. 40 years. Finally, Joshua came. God said, okay, pack your bags. Now I'll take you all to the promised land. It's here only, close by. You just have to break the walls and just walk. Now, if we had Google Maps at that time, and you've gone back and see, they say, God, why did you do this? In 20 days, we would have reached. But you made us go 40 years all around that same mountain. I've come here before. But why? Our actions have consequences. Look at Moses. He knew that God had called him. He knew it. But he went and killed the Egyptian. 40 years of delay. Look at Gehazi. He knew that he's going to be the next prophet. But he made a mistake. He went after money. Look at King Saul. He knew that there was jealousy in him. There was a problem. He had to deal with it. He didn't deal with it. Judgment came upon him. So when, when we sin, we must understand that you know, there will be consequences for our action. They need to know that there is an everlasting punishment. Now, many times we make decisions in our life and we blame God for that. Right? We can sometimes make decisions and say, God, why did you let this happen? Or because I did this, now see what's happening. God would say, I never told you to do it. If you read the book of Ezekiel, there were many false prophets who were, who were there. They were saying, don't worry, Israel, Judah, you don't worry. Everything will be good. God is a loving God. God will rescue you. He will lift you up. No, God is always um, faithful to us. Now then Ezekiel comes and says, I never said that. They're all false prophets. They're saying what they feel like saying. I never said this. In my mind, I'm going to destroy you. The Babylonians are on the way. They're going to finish you off. Now, listen, the reason I'm trying to do, say this is when we do something wrong, there should, there will be judgment. There should be, uh, you know, actions that God will take. Yet, in God's mercy, that's why the cross is so merciful. The place of grace. We continue to sin, we continue to sin, we continue to sin. Still, God is gracious. That's why the cross is so important. And the Holy Spirit brings us into a place of judgment. He says, if we continue to sin, we will fall under the judgment of God. So I need to ch change. There is a place called hell. There is a place where I will be, you know, I will go through judgment. I'll go through challenges in my life. And if that's the case, I, I, I don't want to see that, so I want to change my life. Right? Judgment 
is related to mercy. God judges his people because he's a merciful God. Everyone get this? He brings people, he judges people, he brings them with correction because he loves them. If I don't correct my children, and I, if I don't you know, make them right in certain things that are not right, I am not a good father. Yes or no? I say, okay, do what do you want, kids. Go play, jump, do whatever you want. Now, I may be a cool father, but I'm not a good father. As a good father, the Holy Spirit comes to bring judgment. And he says, no, you've got to correct this in your life. This is wrong. If you don't correct this, this is what will happen to you. Right? It is the Holy Spirit only that can produce such kind of conviction. The Holy Spirit, totally testifies of Jesus. Powerful. John chapter 15 and verse 26. Read that. John 15, 26. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. He will testify about me. Everyone say testify. Now think of this. Think of a courtroom. Right? You're in the courtroom. You've got the, the, the head judge is sitting there. And then you've got a lawyer who's fighting your case. What is the lawyer doing? The lawyer is testifying on your behalf. So if you look at the court, I'm just sitting. You, you know, for example, I parked the car in a wrong place. Now they've called me to court because I've got uh, a no parking uh, fine. So I'm sitting in the court. Now this lawyer is saying, asking me, why did you park there? I said, see, the road is all dug up. There's nowhere else to park. So I had to park here because I'm a teacher in the school. There's no other place to park. The road is all dug up there. So I parked here. Oh, that's the reason you park. So you don't do this every time. No, I don't do this. Every time. Only one time. Because the road was there. So now, in the court, this lawyer is saying, see, judge, this man has been working in this school for 25 years. In 25 years, he has never parked wrong. And the reason he's parked the wrong place is because there was... Some work that was digging up the road work was happening there. So he had to park on the other side. Now, I'm not explaining anything. Who's doing the explanation? My lawyer. He's testifying of me and he's testifying of the situation that happened there. And the judge will say, okay, 25 years, you never made a mistake. And you only made this because he was digging up. So I let you go without a fine. Go ahead. You're free to go. Now what's happening? The Holy Spirit is testifying to us about Jesus. We are singing a song in worship. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes and we feel the love of Jesus. He's testifying about him. Suddenly, we see there are miracles that are happening. He's testifying of Jesus. Suddenly, there's maybe a, a, a deep sorrow or a burden for lost lives is testifying about Jesus. Maybe there's a feeling of loneliness and during worship time you just feel the joy of the Lord is testifying about Jesus. He testifies. Saying, hey, don't worry. I am there with you. I will testify. And whatever you speak, I will testify it with signs, wonders and miracles. Or I'll testify it with God's word. The word of God. You speak the word, I'll testify it. See what the Holy Spirit is doing? Right? Let's read Acts 5.32. We are witness, witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, uh, again, Peter is saying here, we are witnesses of what we are speaking of. We are not talking about something that happened 100 years back. We are witnesses and God has given us the Holy Spirit who testifies of this. So if you're looking at how I heal this 
this crippled man in front of the temple it is by the power of jesus in the name of jesus we've seen jesus do it so we are doing it and the holy spirit is testifying it through us the holy spirit uses the word of god and he can convict an individual the holy spirit is the one who testifies of everything that we do everything that we do when we read the word sometimes we may not believe you know maybe an unbeliever you give them a bible is reading the word the holy spirit is testifying he may be reading about jesus for the first time in his life not even opened a bible but the holy spirit is testifying you are reading about this person named jesus he is god he is real he can change your situation and i know what you're going through and this person is reading the bible for the first time in his in his life and his life can change he testifies right now as believers you know the holy spirit testifies to us in our lives as well right in a way that you know sometimes he may say he may tell us to do things he may tell us to go out of our way out of our comfort zone he may ask us to you know to get things done whether it's ministry or whether in our personal lives whatever he's asking us he's testifying so that you know we have a right standing before god to say hey you're righteous amen and so beautiful to know the work of the holy spirit so we'll take a break we'll come back and we'll go to chapter 8